At what point do you move things to 75% off? And then the other question is what happens when 75% off doesn't sell? What do you suggest to your clients? I always say donations is kind of the next best thing, unless you're kind of running a contest and you're giving things for free, you can kind of use it as, as marketing for your own store. Mm. Uh, but between the two, I think those are your, your best options there. Um, what, what do you generally, what do your clients do? You know, we, I, the pharmacy that we have more, a lot of markdowns at the pharmacy. So we have like a, because the strategy a lot of people will do, um, you know, for the stragglers, they'll do that Nordstrom rack thing of like, try and sell it at full price. These are our favorites, get them while you can, which I can't stand what that mm -hmm. looks like. Cause it looks like to me already, it looks like a sale, but you're, but it's at regular price. So my, I'm like super aggressive, 50% off, put it on a rack, put it outside. Like for the pharmacy apparel is our number one division, believe it or not, but yeah. we drag the sale rack outside. And it, it's like, there's two two thoughts on that. A lot of people are like, you're training your customers that they're sale. And then the other part of it is then what do you do? Pack it up and we're going to sit on it for, you know, six months and then drag it out for, you know, the buy biannual sale. I'm like, I, I don't think a sale rack looks great outside your door all year long, but I feel like there's a place you can tuck a sale rack or make one bay or unit a sale area and kind of have it very back of the store. And then, so that's kind of my philosophy because I, I, you have to move product and the idea to me of packing it up and not having it a sale. You know, I've lived through that with Fred Siegel. It does yeah. not work. Especially not now. I, I just think again, maybe a decade ago it did, but right now we're, we're dealing with a very spoiled customer you know, so I, I, I don't know. Their expectations are high. They are looking for a sale. They are looking for a deal. And I think the customer who's shopping the sale won't necessarily shop regular price. Thank you. It's not your regular sale. customer. You know, so, two, yeah. two stores have done something that's really brilliant. Anthro created their, like they knew they had to move sales. So they actually created a sale room. So it's all off the floor. It's not the first thing you see and people know where to go get it. And it's easy. A store here in California called Kingfisher Lane. She was really smart because they would have this big like end of season sale. They actually took another storefront and they call it the Kingfisher Annex. So mm -hmm. it automatically goes there. The two girls that run the annex run their own Instagram. So they're always showing what's on sale. So it still looks fresh and it still looks fun and it's still new. And it, it, ha it has an automatic place for it to go when it's time to change it. And they work with an open to buy person. So they're very smart with their numbers. Yeah. Which I thought was a super smart. Okay. So you had brought up a couple terms and I want you to explain them to everyone here because most of the people that listen, there are some, re uh, some apparel, but most people are um, gift stores is uh, core. The definitions of the departments of how you how people buy core fashion etc so will you explain those terms and um terminology so core am i defining core within fashion or core within retail i'd say both fashion is what you were referring it to which i think is fascinating because i know the terms but i think though you know in the gift land um people don't use those terms but i think they still apply i yeah. call it bread and butter um for my gift lines so that was going to be my definition. So core is basically the bread and butter of your business. And it's what brings forth the sales. Um, for example, if you're looking at apparel, I think core for an apparel line is the basic tee and the matching uh, bottom, uh, your basic white uh, shirt or, or black shirt or your basic uh, black dress. When I bought jewelry, my core business consisted of studs and hoops for a certain, um, a certain size that were like your, you know, no brainer impulse buy almost if you had, if you had the right price uh, attached to it. So core is basically what gives your business the strength to move forward. So core is what brings in the money, core is what pays the bills, core is what keeps the lights off. Um, 
when it comes to more of retail core, you're looking at anything that's uh, food related. So the uh, waters, the snacks uh, of the world. I used to buy for hotel gift shops and our core department bought all of the snacks, uh, you know, limit, limited personal hygiene items, um, all of uh, the drink options from water to the gutter rates to the Red Bulls of the world. Um, so that's in, in a nutshell what core is. So could, should core be, what percentage of your buy should your core be? 50%? Depending on the category of business you're in, I want to say I'm comfortable at 60 personally, um, especially right now. I think you really have to protect your core business because those are almost guaranteed sales versus everything else that you bring in that's, you know, an educated guess or that or educated selection you've made but there's no guarantee to it now if i know that my teas in black gray and white sell day in and day out at the sharp price point of 39 dollars uh, i'm going to protect that business and i want dollars to go towards that inventory more so than the fashion now how do you keep from having your floor look uh boring or dated or the same all the time this is when you get creative with sprinkling in your fashion and sprinkling in your trends so fashion should probably be between five and ten percent and then trend is probably another twenty percent and I think that's where the key comes with merchandising where you are sprinkling it in and you are cutting some of that core into with the fashion. So it all kind of reads as one and you're able to get it out throughout the whole entire store. Yeah. And again, you, you guys create the magic, the visual merchandisers, because you can take something as boring as, you know, a basic tea and re-merchandise it in a way that tells a story, in a way that attracts, in a way that's cohesive uh, yeah. visually. So th that's why all of these positions are needed and all of this people who do provide the services are so important. I know that for small business owners, it's tough because money is tight, right? So what, how can you afford to get, to pay a consultant? How can you afford to pay a visual merchandiser? But these are the people that will make your business jump to the next level and grow and hopefully flourish to, to a level where you can expand, you know, open more stores and so on. But if you just keep it small and keep it, just within the confines of what you know, uh, it, you know, you're limiting yourself and you're limiting your business. I, I thank you for saying that because it, it's, uh, somebody had coined the phrase, uh, a merchandiser, visual merchandisers are your silent salespeople. Is that, you know, and if you work with, this, with a merchandiser, ideally, like I, I go off of numbers as well as, you know, I work with my clients on what's new, the, what's driving your business, what reports and what, and I, ideally any merchandise that you do bring in is working with all that as well as making it look beautiful. Because I'd said a long time ago, like, it doesn't matter how pretty it is if it's not selling. And if your merchandiser is only going off of visual and not your business and not your numbers and your reports, then, um, you know, it's only, it's only going to get you so far, but I, I you know, I think that it, it is at a cost, but I, what I've realized with all of my, my retailers, like the one we just did in Philly, we, I had changed her whole entire floor plan because they had a lot of tables that were blocking things. And so we opened up this floor plan and then we did display, there's a line called free city out here. That's like, they're like $175 mm -hmm. sweatshirt sweats. It's like, but they have a huge name recognition. So we moved that up front, made sure the name was seen by the way we did the display. And it's like, I got an email back from the owners right away. And he's like, we just want to say thank you so much because honestly, like we sold so much free city over this weekend, more than we have in that location before. And that's, that is, I think where you see the instant return, not always instant, but you do see a return based on how your merchandiser reworks your floor. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you have to live it to the experts. So when I was buying for 215 stores, we wow. would create visual merchandising director for our stores. And sometimes I would go to store visits and the managers purely out of, you know, interest of, of getting their business to the next level would re-merchandise it themselves. And there's a reason why there's people who's pure job is to do this because we all think we have great ideas and we all think certain things look great 
but most of the time they tend to fall short unless you're well experienced, you're well vetted in, in the industry and you know kind of how the consumer shops, perceptions, you know, how they experience the store, how they walk it and so on. And that's that's not something that you learn from one day to the next. Yeah, it's I love being able to go into stores where the team is open to it, but a lot of times it somebody ends up very upset and takes it. And I and like I said to, to the clients when I was, I, it was such a great experience going back to Philly because the entire team was so excited to have us there. Like I brought in another mer merchandiser that lives in Philly to continue mm -hmm. keeping this on for them because it's like yeah. you do it once a quarter, it's going to be demolished in a couple months and they're not going to be able to put yeah. it back. But to have the team be so excited, like, no, we want to learn, we want to know. But most of the times I run into the situation where it's like, you know, and I can't blame them because whoever's been doing the merchandising has really owned the business and they love what they're doing. And it's like, you're almost taking, they take it as you're taking something away from them or they're Absolutely. doing it wrong. And mm -hmm. yeah, you have to kind of like massage through that. And it's like, it's a lot. <laughs> it's, a it lot. Is. it's a lot. It's, you know, it's people management. It's, you know, you have to kind of figure out what the best way to to you know deliver the messages and, and sometimes there is no best way and sometimes you just have to walk on eggshells until you figure out yeah you know what your angle is my my new phrase I tell everybody now is like okay everyone I'm just gonna say you need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable because things I'm gonna be doing and showing you are are yeah. clearly different than how you're doing them and there's a reason why I'm here so so that's now my new phrase, <laughs> get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Okay. I want to get into a little bit of the stuff that you and I've been going back and forth that has been happening in fashion through the news, because I'm dying to talk to you about a couple of them. One, I didn't realize that the fake pay less store that's been showing up on social media, that was in 2018. I had, yeah. I thought it was because it's just resurfaced. Yeah. I think it's brilliant for those of you who haven't seen it or heard it, pay less created a fake um, pop-up store. And they, I think they called it Pele or something like that. Lessie. And they, Kalesi, they took their shoes, their brands, they took the labels off, put the new labels on and, and invited all of these fashion influencers who were going crazy for the Payless shoes. And like, and they actually, I think they put like $700, like $35 shoes. They were putting $700 tags and filmed the whole thing. And then the influencers bought them and then it was like, okay, by the way, fake store, it's all pay less goods. Tell what is your what are your thoughts on that? That's basically a stunt. And I've read now some of the pushback from people like yeah. I can't believe they did that. Yeah. But I think it's brilliant. I would love to hear your thought. I think it's brilliant too. It's very telling of the times we live in. It's very telling of how you know it's no longer about quality and it's 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 about access and it's about do I get a first and am I special enough because we live in this world now where you know it's it's almost this weird competition that everybody has on social media of who's getting access to what first and who you know first dips on something new and different um but it also goes to show you that the regular consumer is not really trained on quality yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's what we feed them through marketing and advertising yes. that they basically take in and translate into into purchases. Uh, but and, and that's normal. I mean, you walk into any store and you see the way people shop, people shop by brands, people shop by status um, and people shop by price point. Right. Nobody's really getting into picking up a pair of shoes and then looking, oh, is the upper leather? What is it handmade? Uh, what's the sole? You know, what and, and so on. And and again, that's that's normal, I would assume, for the regular consumer not to be fully aware of it. Now, when it comes to social media, that worked because social media is fueled by you know having access and, and being treated special and 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 you know just being first to know about something and then hopefully they also look at it as a business once they you know post about it then people can hopefully buy from the site and they profit through some sort of commission agreement that they might have down the line with the with a brand so the influencer I, thing is mind-boggling to me the influencer thing is like 
I mean, I, I, I will Tell admit I've gotten it. sucked into so many stupid things on Instagram where I, I end up like shop, like buying something like click to buy. And I'm like, what? I, and, and some of the quality has been good. A lot of it, it's been crappy. And it's literally because I just have gotten like completely fish hooked into buying something. Right. But my, my, I'm always wondering now, like how long is that trend going to go for? Cause like, is everything going to be driven by uh, influencers or is that going to, I feel like it's going to peter out at some point, but I don't know. I mean, it's like, it, it's such a machine now. It is, but I, I think also consumer buying trends are changing, especially for the other younger cohorts. So I think we're becoming more conscious on what, how much we're consuming at what we're consuming and what rate. Um, so sustainability is coming into play and sustainability is a, a whole other thing where I have a lot of opinions on. Um, but people are really a, becoming a little bit more conscious on what they're buying and how, you know, how often uh, frequency and so on. So hoping that it dies down, I think social media has done great things um, even for retail in a way, but I think there's a lot of negative aspects to it that are, are kind of building up. And I think it's getting to a point where we need to step away a little bit. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. And on the sustainability uh, topic, you had sent me, you said we want to talk about Kourtney Kardashian's um, collab, which I hadn't heard about it. So tell me about the, the collab and, and your thoughts on it. This is the Boho and Kourtney Kardashian? Yeah. So I I did a little bit of um, kind of research and looking at what the line looks like. So it's a sustainable collection that Kourtney Kardashian Baker, um, I guess, put together with a Bo uh, Boho team. Um, sustainable in a way because some of the materials, very, very um, small percent, I would say, of the materials uh, come from recycl uh, recyclable um, materials, but you have abundance when it comes to polyester usage. Uh, price points are very alarming to me because if you are pricing something at $10, in my opinion, somebody, someone is not getting paid. Someone yeah. is losing out. Uh, and if someone is losing out, whatever party or entity that is, then we cannot say that this is sustainable in any sort of way. Um, so I think price point is a red flag. I think materials used and material composition of a lot of the items is a red flag to me. And then speed to market too. I mean, they call it what it is and it is fast fashion. She did put out a statement where she said that at least she's bringing forth um, kind of more uh, eye eyeballs into the matter. And that although they did a good job, she's open to suggestions from other people and so on. Oh, that's another experts in the field. Because I hadn't heard about that. And I, you know, I, I was like interested in hearing like what, because it, yeah. you know, it, it's the Kardashians are such a machine that um, they, they're, it doesn't feel like a lot is being done for the greater good without, yeah. without not being mean, but you know. I, yeah, I think the Skims line that the other sister has, I think they have hit gold in terms of, Market marketing, I think, in terms of the assortment them itself, I think this is where Victoria's Secret lost out. Victoria's Secret had such a big portion of the intimate apparel market, right? And what did they decide to do? Do the same thing day in and day out, have the same supermodels in, um, make every other woman feel inferior in so many ways, um, and just keep on going, you know, decade after decade, Skims brings forth just the basic concept of a nude shade. What was nude? We were taught that nude was that beige undertone, ugly shade, and that's it. Yeah. Didn't matter your, your ethnicity, it didn't matter your skin color, that was the nude available. Just bringing forth such inclusivity in terms of colorways um, and in terms of it being available to mass market, I think that was so smart. But why didn't Victoria's Secret think of that? They had the platform, they had the audience, they had the eyeballs. It's the old way. It's like the JC Penny. It's only they're yeah. still doing tons of business. They know who they, but it's like they, the old way of this is how we've always done it. And we're not right. going to, I mean, I love skims because the inclusivity of the sizes of women. I mean, that to me, I mean, I, I posted something the other day on stories is that they had this beautiful, 
um, a girl and she was in a wheelchair and it wasn't a fake wheelchair. I mean, like it was truly because you could tell the way her feet yeah. were. And it was like, I, I just like, that is so commendable that, you know, like big women, small women. I mean, it, it's that uh, along with the skin tones, it's like that, I think is huge to me as far as, because no one, people are starting to do it now, but it's still, there's still such a stigma of that. Yeah. Um, then we're going to talk about uh, the Kanye thing, because I, so this is the thing, like I, I, for me, it's like a, Gap seems to have lost their way. I know they've tried to partner with several people and created collabs with them. And it seems like every single one of them has bombed and they, they, they have their basics, but it seems, and the, the newest one with Kanye, who has obviously giant brand recognition, the shopping out of the bag thing. I didn't realize that's a whole trend that you know, I had to be schooled on it from someone's kid who's like 19 or 16 or something like that. Uh -huh. But shopping, like bin shopping at a Salvation Army bins is a whole thing. And I guess that is part of what that was, is. But also Valencia did the shopping bag, the trash bag shopping bag. So yeah. I want to hear your take on this. I mean, there's, again, with, with a good percent of the business going through e-commerce, retailers have to get creative and they have to find ways in which they need they can bring the customer into the store right so was it innovative in a way not particularly to me but maybe there were people that thought it was uh, innovative i think some of kanye's statements were that he wanted it to be more inclusive and and less classist and and just have it um you know be available to everyone for everyone um, I think there's a fine line there. I think price point needs to match, you know, the shopping experience too. Um, I also think obviously Gab didn't agree with it because like you had mentioned, they didn't really roll it out in brick and mortar stores. They did change their New York Times Square location and they made it uh, more basic. I think a lot of black hues with, with the um, construction bags they are apparently. Um, I just can't get over like the not to help customers like that, like right. that. Okay. It just seems like that is retail suicide. Like, right. You're going to, we're going to stick everything in this giant bin and yeah. you're going to pitch you. through it. And then we'll ring you up over here. Yeah. There was also talk about this being a more sustainable way of yes. merchandising because you're not using hangers. So you're using less materials to merchandise. I think when we talk about sustainability, we just like to throw the term out there. I think we need to take a step back and define what sustainability is um, before we start calling ourselves and the brands we create sustainable. Because I, mean, I think there's a lot of greenwashing and all of it that just needs to be explained further. Yeah, I think the word works for where people want it to work. Like, and it's yeah. like, P.S., you can fold them as well and they can still be sized <laughs> and you yeah. don't have hanger. <laughs> and people would know exactly which pile to look at and pick from versus just um, taking them out. But also, I think one of the weirdest thing about the collaboration was that it was a 10 year agreement. Like wow. what retailer thinks that it's like good to have a partnership with a brand for 10 years? I think, you know, the whole beauty of partnerships is that it's time sensitive. There's an urgency to buy the assortment before it sells out till something else comes in. A 10 yep. year partnership to me, just it just there was a lot of red flags with that, in my opinion. It loses the scarcity. And I always talk about this, like, you know, the buy it now, the scarcity mentality of, you know, you have your bread and butter lines and then you have something and it's like, I talk about this a lot with my retailers is that, you know, you, you want to get your customers understanding. You only have six of this, like it's not coming back. It's like, yeah. it's in, it's out your bread and butters. You know, you're always going to reorder day in, day out, but this collection, this group, Except this line, like this is yeah. this is it. That you're, and I think that that's the same thing for for Gap. Like you can't have that scarcity when you're talking ten. It's going to be around for ten years. Yeah, no, you can't. You can't. I, I think. I think that. I also think there wasn't any uh, meaning behind the 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 partnership. I think there wasn't 
enough synergy for it to even be successful. I think they obviously had a lot of hiccups from the beginning and then it, you know, it culminated with a termination yesterday. Uh, but I, it, to me, it makes sense. I, I don't think that was the right partnership for either party. If Gap was your client, what would you advise them on? Oh, so many things. I think re kind of re-looking at the basic business and the core business and figuring that out. I think uh, the sizing chart with Gap, I think it's another huge issue. Um, you know, in the US, we don't have a standard uh, sizing chart. So no. every brand and retailer gets creative with that. Um, I just think there's something to be said about, you know, creating, uh, you know, a sizing chart that that's it, it, it makes consumers feel a certain way um, towards you shopping with you versus not. I think they're like a size off for every size. I think okay. of a two is a four. Okay. Uh, I think the four is a six. So I think there's, uh, there's a lot there to be desired with that because that also affects your return rate. And if you're a smart retailer, you also want to educate your consumer that they are fully aware at what sizes they are in your brand because you're going to cut your retail, uh, your return rate by a good 20, 30% if you do that. Um, partnerships, visual merchandising, um, and, and how, and, and figuring out the why, going back to the why. Um, now that you said that, now I have to ask you, because I've been super um, vocal about how anthropology has changed since they brought in their new president. Mm -hmm. Not new anymore, but he is the ex-president of Under Armour, which to me is the least aesthetic brand. And like, you know, it's, it, and he was brought in to make the company profitable. Um, and now to me, when I go, I, the key stores, Rock Center, you know, the big ones all still have mm -hmm. that touch of hand feel and the display element. But you know, more and more now I'm going into some of their stores and there's the big blow up image with the low. And it's like, it yeah. feels like it's, you know, starting to go down the, the, you know, pedestrian route, I guess, for Anthro. What, what it, what is your thought on that? I love that I get to ask you all these questions, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And, and I agree with you. It is, and it loses its uniqueness and it loses the reason why we all shop there and why we all go there, even for the visual aspect of it, even when you don't buy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think from like a corporate perspective, it's easier to manage something that's standardized, something that's the same day in and day out. However, from the consumer experience, consumer sh uh, shopping um, experience rather, I think it, it, there's a lot there to be desired. I think the next thing I'm concerned about is that they're gonna play with price points and they're gonna start with a lower um, ticket item that in hopes of bringing in a wider audience, which in turn is going to erode their brand DNA, in my opinion. Yeah, it's going to be interesting because it's so sad to watch it. You know, it, it, it's because I was there during, you know, we only had, I think, 14 stores when I was there and it's like, right. you know, it was so special. And so, and now to watch, you know, like it kills me to go in some of those stores, but like the big ones, the rock center and those that do like millions and millions, and millions, those still have that like major wow factor and the huge window impact. And, yeah. but the others, it's really sad to watch it go the route that it's going. I really hope they respect their their buyers and, and the way that they have always purchased and brought forth assortments. And I hope they protect that because I think if they don't, um, I think that's also going to shift their business tremendously. Well, they got rid of everybody that, I mean, in, in, you know, in cutting costs, I can't imagine what yeah. the payroll was, but they they literally have gotten rid of all of the the creatives and a lot of the buyers that were on, you know, on board during that time that made the brand what it is. So it's, you know, it's, it's, I'm sure it's going to be much more homogenized as, as it goes down the road. It's like the playbook of how to run down a brand, how to just break it apart if you can't. Sad. I, yeah. So I um, always ask people a couple of last questions. Um, one is because you're in the industry and I'm dying to know, where do you find inspiration? Oh, everywhere. I, I also, I'm a little spoiled because I live in Miami. You walk down the street and you find inspiration everywhere. I'm a huge, huge, huge um, 
follower of WGSN, WWD, I think, seeing what's happening around the world. Their, their trend forecasting reports are amazing. Um, their buyer's reports are amazing. So there's a lot there. Um, and then I also love reading and going back to kind of basics and, and going back to the history of fashion, uh, you know, and, and figuring out some, looking at old Harper's Bazaar covers and looking at, at how, I was going down a rabbit hole last night, looking at Gap's um, advertising campaigns when they were really strong. So this is 89, 90, 91, 92. Um, kind of the aesthetics of it, you know, how they were approaching the customers, what were the taglines, what were they advertising? Um, and there's a lot there. As we know, fashion is cyclical, right? So part of, of, of finding inspiration, sometimes it's going back, uh, back in history and kind of uh, looking through that as well. I love that. And then um, I, this is a new question is because the podcast originated with stories and lessons from a life in retail. And I talk a lot about my stories and lessons. What yeah. is, your biggest lesson as both a retailer and an educator? Oh God, my, one of my favorite sayings is that um, youth is wasted on the young. Mm. And I think the biggest lesson <laughs> is going back in time, being more confident and being more inquisitive asking why, asking questions, and not being so intimidated. Mind you, I started with Macy's Corporate, uh, you know, very much a hierarchy of, of, of a company. So, you know, going into these meetings with VPs and so on, uh, you know, having the chance to speak up more and speak my mind more and, and obviously listen and take that in too. But I think more inquisitive and also just um, just more confident overall. Because you realize that everybody is figuring out as they grow and as they go along and nobody has all the answers, especially in retail, no matter how much experience you have, how you, great you are at it. And kind of taking it from that point of view and realizing that we're all, you know, having the discussions and having the conversations only makes us all better and, and we grow towards being better merchants. Oh my God. Thank you so much. That was phenomenal i really i mean i can't thank you enough for doing this with me i know this is like something I love that. i tried to get on the books for so long so i'm so grateful that you came on board and you told us and shared your knowledge because it's fashion part of it i'm so submerged in gift but i you know i came from fashion from fred siegel and it's like it is one of those things that is so near and dear to my heart. And I don't have as many fashion people on here that are retail consultants, even more like to be able to like, really like pick your brain and get to ask some of these questions that I have. So thank you so much. No, it was, it was a great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your time. I listened to your episodes um, and, and I enjoy kind of, you know, hearing about all the different aspects of the business and the different categories within businesses. So it, it's wonderful. Oh, thank you. Uh, for some reason, it's like not there it is.